So thank you very much uh, for the new PGU session. So I'll give in front of you uh, Connor Coulet, who is assistant professor at the MIT. Uh, so he received his uh, bachelor and PhD in chemical engineering from Caltech and, and is already at MIT and did a postdoc uh, at uh, the Broad Institute. And he's uh, yes, developed a lot of uh, methods, in, especially in predicting. Uh, 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 the consecutive schemes, the consecutive pathways, cosmo molecules, the different outcomes of ion interactions, and uh, the new molecular generation. He is recipient of the uh, CLN Planet 12 award, fourth magazine 30 under 30, for healthcare. Uh, he got the NSF Career Award uh, via Early Excellence in Science Award, and is also an advisor uh, for uh, small uh, biotech companies. And you can work on bioform companies. And uh, he's going to talk uh, today about the uh, learning patterns of chemical reactivity from experimental data. So you have 40 minutes, of course. Mr. So, thank you. I regret sending in such a long bio. All right. Um, so, hi, everybody. My name is Connor. I'm an assistant professor at MIT in Boston. Um, I sort of sit at this interface in chemical engineering, electrical engineering, and computer science. What I wanted to do today is talk a little bit about reaction informatics. And rather than talk extensively about the own work that we do in the group, I wanted to give sort of an overview of the field. And in some ways, this talk is going to be like a review article crammed into about the next 40 minutes. So there's gonna be a lot of references, a lot of different topics are gonna to come up. Um, I can send you a PDF of the slide, so don't feel like you have to take notes on, on the references that I pull up here. So overall in the group, we think a lot about closed loop discovery and thinking about the ways that we can automate the discovery of new functional molecules. Of course, drug discovery is the main application that we'd like to think about, but you can also apply these same concepts to materials discovery, discovery of agricultural products and herbicides, pesticides. And so of course, like many, we wanna close the loop, right? We wanna sort of think about the ways to design platforms and workflows such that we have algorithms help us each step of the way. So we rely on computer aided molecular design, we want to rely on computer-aided synthesis planning, automated synthesis and testing, and of course, we can use that information to update our models and iterate. And so the way that we do this is through a number of areas at the bottom. I'm um, not going to go into too much detail there because I do want to leave enough time to talk about synthesis, which is the main topic for today. Uh, so of course, reaction informatics is sort of a subfield of chem informatics, I'd say. So why do we care about reactions? Well, in case it's not obvious, we have to worry about synthetic chemistry when it comes to actually accessing the molecules that we design. And so it doesn't really matter how we're designing molecules, we can use these sort of enumeration schemes on the left. You're probably most familiar with libraries like e means real space and other sorts of virtual make on demand sets, where of course the way that we define the chemical space we can access is by taking molecules that we can buy or that we have in stock, reaction transformations that we believe we know how to run, and we use that to enumerate <coughs> billions or larger Right, of, of these compounds. Then for de novo design, things get a little messier. So we already heard a little bit about using synthesis as sort of a post hoc filter. That's because when you use generative models, depending on the type of model and the type of approach, you can get some reasonable looking structures like the ones at the top, but you can also get some not so reasonable structures like the ones at the bottom. And so we really need to think about synthetic feasibility as a way of constraining the space that we're searching. And so what I wanna do is talk a little bit about sort of the basics of reaction informatics, the way that we think about representations, um, but I also wanna talk about the tasks involved. So that's one of the main takeaways that I hope you get at the end of this talk is really just thinking about the different things we can do with the reaction data and the different types of learning problems that people have been uh, trying to, to pursue. I like to organize these on this axis of increasing degree of extrapolation. And you can also see this as increasing degree of sort of interest to a chemist. Right. So we can start off with the simplest cases, and that's reaction deployment. What I mean by deployment is really using known knowledge about known reactions just to new substrates. It's the simplest degree of extrapolation where we're trying to plan retrosynthetic routes, perhaps, to new molecules, but we're not doing anything super creative. We're using reactions that we know how to run. As you move up in extrapolation to development, you're now starting to think about um, Sort of expanding our knowledge of reactivity a little bit further. So what conditions should you use for a new transformation? Or how do you optimize those conditions? What substrate scope is compatible with the transformation? We're starting to sort of push at the boundaries of our synthetic knowledge. 
then the last category, reaction discovery, is the most open-ended. And this is really where I think a lot of the field wants to move, especially those coming from the synthetic chemistry perspective, not the drug discovery perspective. We want to use these models to elucidate mechanisms and find brand new synthetic methods. And so we're going to sort of step through these tasks and talk a little bit about the approaches that have been taken after we go through some preliminaries about representation and about the types of data sets that we work with. So in case it's been a while, here's a reaction. Um, so you can see we've got this annotation of you know, one reactants, one product. We've got information about the conditions. So this is an epoxidation using MCPBA. We have some notion of the quantitative details, so the equivalent that we're using, some catalysts, some solvents, time, temperature. And this is how chemists typically describe these types of transformations. Right? They'll visually depict them in their papers. Now, commonly, right, in our databases, we use smile strings. And so quite often, sort of our source of grounds truth are going to be reaction smiles. The reaction smiles, of course, just tell you definition of the reactant structures, definition of the product structure, if you want to be fancy, you can include conditions between the sort of arrows, and you can just note the, um, the different species that are present. If you want to be even fancier, right, you can do atom mapping, and you can then denote the correspondence between atoms in the reactants and atoms in the product, and this is very helpful for a lot of the downstream learning tasks that we'll talk about. But what I wanted to convey is, you know, even though we often work with reaction smiles in our databases, it's a really incomplete way of describing reactions. Right, so we lose all of these quantitative details, we lose the roles of the agents, even if we put them in our reaction smiles. And so reaction smiles are not very satisfying. Um, a lot of people use RD files, but the way that you encode data in RD files is not actually as standardized as we would like. There's a lot of heterogeneity in how different companies store this information, how different electronic lab notebooks store this information. So when we think about using reactions as the input to learning algorithms, like we will do for many of these tasks, we have a lot of choices. One of the sort of distinguishing factors between different representations is whether we want the reaction to be defined in terms of the reactants and the product, or if a reaction is really just about the reactants, let's say we're predicting the product instead. But in general, right, reactions are sort of an extension of molecules in a sense. And so many of the same tools that we use for small molecule representation and learning can be applied to reactions. So we know about reaction smile strings. And so of course, string representations are a pretty natural way of thinking about representing reactions. You just take the reaction smiles, use it as input to some sort of language model. Makes sense. Often we think about reactions as their constituent molecular components. So we can either take sort of a set of reactants and reagents and catalysts and all the conditions we can represent each of those molecules individually, then concatenate them and say, well, that concatenation is now a representation of the reaction. That works fairly well if we have a consistent number of molecules per reaction, or we can treat them as a set of reactant molecules, or we can use extensions to molecular fingerprints to, for example, look at the difference between products and reactants and say, well, that fingerprint in some way captures the difference, that captures the transformation that happens. One of the formulations that I think is, is pretty fun are instead using graphs. So graphs and graph edits are a really natural way of describing reactions because in most organic reactions in these databases, not that much changes. Right? So most of the reaction, most of the structure is the same. And we're really only changing a few bonds or a few atoms. And so that's very related to the sort of notion of the condensed graph of reaction, which was very much popularized by Professor Barnack, right? The notion that a lot of the structure stays the same and you can really just highlight the new atom, which are the new bonds that are formed or the bonds that are broken or the changes in bond order. So this graph formulation is one that, that's going to come up sort of over and over again in the talk um, because it is quite, I think, a natural way of describing these, these reactions. Uh, when it comes to conditions, things are a little bit fuzzier. Okay, so if we're talking about representing reaction conditions, right, how do you represent that something was run at 100 millimolar? That's, there's not sort of one single choice that people use in the field, and often people just ignore those aspects of the conditions. And so there's a lot of work to be done. I think standardize even how we store and represent reaction conditions for these models, but that's, that could be an entire talk on its own. And so because we are worrying about reactions as uh, these sort of data structures made up of molecules, um, the same sorts of debates that happen in molecular representation happen for reactions. So we worry about things like, should molecules be represented by fingerprints, right? Just capturing structure. Should they be represented by graphs capturing the structure or maybe descriptors that we compute using density functional theory and other sorts of methods. Um, descriptors tends not to be used much for reactants, 
but they're used quite extensively for things like catalysts, because if you look at a lot of organometallic catalysts, these are not well represented by smile strings. Right? Smile strings do not do a good job of capturing the sort of properties of these catalyst complexes, and so we often will use expert-derived descriptors from things like density functional theory, again, to represent these structures. So this is a very nice review by Rob Payton um, in Accounts of Chemical Research that sort of talks about the different sorts of representations that one might use on a stream. In terms of data, all of the work, or almost all of the work in reaction informatics uses a handful of data sets. And this is really a shame, but it's because of the availability of this data. Most of us and most public bench, publicly benchmarked programs are going to use the USPTO data set. So this is a CC0 license data set from Daniel Lowe. Um, because it is CC0 license, it means that we can publish it, we can publish different splits, and it's purely, you know, it's fully reproducible. It's a fantastic data set for that. But it just comes from US patents. And so some of us will then buy data sets like Pistachio, which is a commercial data set, which has US and European patents. It's a little bit larger, a few million reactions. And then some of us will uh, spend months and years of our lives negotiating with other commercial publishers to try to get access to things like Reaxis or SciFinder data, uh, sometimes successfully, sometimes not successfully. On this sort of other column here, right, this is sort of showing patents and literature, and, and Reaxis and SciFinder do cover sort of academic articles. We have data sets from high throughput experimentation. This is a much smaller source of data just because of the number of high throughput experimental campaigns that have been reported. But you are starting to see these data sets emerge coming out of companies uh, who have the capability to generate them. There's a nice CN coupling data set from Merck. There's a nice Suzuki screen from Pfizer. And it's you know, a few thousand reactions in these data sets. And so it's a few thousand data points. And so you can build these really nice local models in these cases where you have a model that just knows about Suzuki couplings, but it knows it fairly well um, within that, that space. So narrow domain of applicability, but still a very useful model. Now, if we have time at the end, which we probably won't because I'm already talking slower than I wanted to, um, we're going to talk about the Open Reaction Database a little bit. So the Open Reaction Database is this new effort that we've started to try to create a new venue and really a new standard for sharing reaction data in this space. And um, it's a fully open access effort, as the name implies. Uh, but again, we can come back to that if there's time. So because most of us actually end up using tools like Reaxis and SciFinder, we're going to take a closer look at what those databases actually have in them, right? It's very, very fun to talk about data-driven chemistry and the notion of learning from experience and learning from hundreds of years of published reactions. But if you look at the information that, that's actually present in an entry from Reaxis, there's a fair amount that's there. So we have reactant structures, we have a major product or a desired product structure, and we have some notion of what conditions were used. You know, they used hydrogen here, they used methanol as a solvent, we know who ran the reaction, and we know sometimes the yield if we're lucky. What actually is missing a lot of information that I would very much like to have. So when you look at these data sets that have been curated by these commercial publishers, they don't have information in detail about concentrations. People don't report or describe side products or byproducts or impurities, which are incredibly important, especially for pharmaceutical manufacturing. And we're missing information about the order of addition, the rate of addition, we don't have any mechanistic data right, in these databases. And so while we do have you know, millions of published reactions spanning hundreds of years of chemistry, there's actually a lot of information that's in the original journal articles that does not get captured in the databases. And so we can't learn from that information yet. So it constrains a bit what we're able to do. And uh, sort of one, one more aside before we actually start talking about some of the learning tasks um, is that I think this is a big problem that people ignore and it's kind of okay to ignore in a quantitative sense, but from a sort of forward-looking perspective, we should not be ignoring the issue that um, this lack of information really complicates how we evaluate these models. And so if you think about the, some of the different learning tasks that we're going to dive into, right, retrosynthesis, going from a product to a set of reactants, always has more than one right answer. But we train and evaluate the models to recapitulate what is found in our databases, ignoring the fact that there's more than one right answer. When we plan multi-step pathways, we have way more than one right answer. Right? We have sort of a combinatorial number of different options. Likewise, for reaction outcome prediction, if we're trying to predict the product of a reaction, 
how are we supposed to predict the product if we don't actually know the temperature or the concentrations, right? It's an underspecified problem, and that's even worse if we're trying to predict yields. But you can find papers, right, doing all of this, and we've published papers doing some of this, where, you know, we, we get away with what we can. Uh, we sort of know that, okay, the model doesn't actually know the concentrations, and so there's no way it should be able to predict the yield of the chemical reaction without that data. But we make assumptions, the model makes assumptions, and we sort of assume these reactions proceed under typical conditions, whatever that means. That's sort of the, the preliminaries of starting to think about the type of information we have access to and the types of tasks that maybe do or don't make sense. Um, but now we're going to talk through these three different categories of deployments, development, and discovery. We'll see how far we get. So I think the, the most popular task in sort of reaction deployment, as I like to call it, is retrosynthetic planning. So retrosynthesis, right again, is just simply going from a product molecule as input and getting one or more reacted molecules as output. In this task, most approaches use reaction templates. So reaction templates are these nice subgraph patterns. We usually codify them with smart strings. We use packages like RDKit to apply them to molecules and sort of virtually transform them. And we can get these reaction templates either by surveying many chemists and writing them down by hands, or we can try to develop some simple heuristics to extract them from published reactions. And so here we're looking at the same epoxidation and if this is an atom mapped example, we can know that the atoms that changed in their local chemical environment were just the ones right around this alkene, right, which turned into the epoxide. So we can define very simple heuristics to extract out this general pattern that says any time I'm trying to do retrosynthetic analysis and I see this trans epoxide with two aromatic substituents, one idea for how to make it is to start from the trans alkene. This is all done heuristically. We start from one reaction, we get one template. And then we apply the same workflow to millions of reactions. We get millions, sometimes, of templates. And really, the learning trick that Marwin Segler uh, developed and nicely demonstrated is that now that we have this massive library of possible reaction rules, right, defined in this very crude sense, you can train a classifier. So we can train a classifier to take a product molecule and then predict which of our tens or hundreds of thousands of rules is best to apply. We train this on experimental data from the literature, and we say, okay, if this product is reported with these reactants, I'm going to train my network to select the Suzuki template. And so then retrosynthetically, we sort of identify that the best strategy for this compound, perhaps, is a sort of retro Suzuki, and then we get these reactants as the suggestion. I'd say probably 80 or 90 percent of synthetic planning programs and um, close to 100 percent of commercial ones use templates as their knowledge base. But there are many more approaches than just using templates. And so of the template-free methods, we have ones based on smile strings. We have ones based on graphs. And one of the ones based on graphs that I like to sort of share is, is one that follows the synthon approach, as uh, you can call it in chemistry. Or maybe we take a product molecule and we first train a graph neural network to select the bonds that should be disconnected. So here we're going to take the product. We train a network to predict the bonds to break. We get synthons, like these incomplete reactant structures, they're not real molecules yet, they have these hanging R groups um, off the end. And the second step of the synthon approach, we figure out, okay, what actual molecules do these synthons correspond to? So here we sort of decide, okay, what are the leaving groups or what are the functional groups present in these positions? And you can do this as a graph completion task using atom by atom generation, or you can just use it as a classification over leaving groups, because there aren't that many leaving groups. An even more sort of unconstrained way of doing this is looking at a graph to smiles architecture. Um, so um, I have mixed opinions about smiles representations. I think graph representations are much stronger as an encoder because one graph corresponds to one molecule, more or less, uh, versus you have many smile strings that corresponds to one molecule. And so in this work, what we did was we took a graph encoder to take the product molecule, learn an embedding, and then decode that using a smiles decoder language models are much, much better at decoding than graph generative models, I have to admit that. So we generate the reactant smile strings and we again train this type of network directly on experimental data from the literature. This graph to smiles takes a product graph, gives you reactive smiles. And so these are just a handful of the approaches. There are dozens of different architectures that have been applied to retrosynthesis. And we all make performance tables like this, we all chase numbers, and this is just sort of the accuracy value again. 
There's always more than one right answer, but we still evaluate in terms of whether our recommender came up with the recorded example in its list of uh, 10 in this case. And so we all sort of chase these sort of few percent differences in performance. And we all sort of struggle to find the right data sets to evaluate on, typically it's the USPTO. Um, I will note there's you know, some other evaluation metrics that have been proposed, but I think there's, there's complications to, to each of them. Uh, but happy to talk more about this um, offline. Multi-step planning, um, sort of taking this sort of single step capability of going from a product back to reactants, um, it's a little bit more complicated because we have this combinatorial explosion of options. So we can again train models to do this for us. We can use existing tree search algorithms. We don't have to get too creative. And we can find pathways to sort of complex molecules that end in viable materials. I'm not going to talk too much about the algorithms, but I'll just point out a couple of the results from uh, two semi-recent papers. So again, um, Arwen Segler on the left with his data-driven program and Bartosz Jabowski with his expert program on the right. These are two preference diagrams, which are conveying the same conclusion. The conclusion that they're showing is that on the left, uh, a panel of chemists had no statistically significant preference between routes proposed by Marwin's data-driven program and routes from the recent literature. So there's no difference between them. And on the right, we're sort of pretending that human chemists are classifiers. We're saying that human chemists fail to classify, they fail to distinguish routes proposed by Cynthia, the commercial program, and routes from the literature. And so the point here is just to say that these types of tools have gotten to a relatively mature state. Right? I think they did hit an inflection point a few years back where now they're actually able to propose routes to relatively complex molecules and they're able to do it with some pretty good reliability. Right? If chemists can't actually tell the difference, in these cases at least, um, it sort of shows that they're coming up with these useful suggestions. This sort of takes us away from retrosynthesis and into the next task of reaction prediction. Um, I very much like this task because there's, in theory, one right answer, even though it's still an underspecified problem with the data that we have access to. Here, what we're doing is we're taking one of our reactant molecules and potentially the conditions and trying to predict the major product of the reaction. And for this task, there are, again, many approaches. So reaction templates tends not to actually work that well in this case. Um, so templates have sort of this limited coverage of possible reactions. And so if our program happens to be missing the template that it needs, it's never going to predict the right product. And so we tend to use these more flexible learned approaches. Again, smiles to smiles has been very popular by Philip Schwaller working at IBM. Graph to graph models, we've spent a lot of time thinking about over the years. Uh, graph to smiles also works here. And just this notion that we're taking reactants as input and outputting a product molecule. All we really require is a way to take in these structures as input and output a new structure. And so one of the approaches that I'll just briefly highlight was developed by uh, Clemens um, Isard, who's now a PhD student working with the Gisbert. So here, we're going to take advantage of the fact that in a chemical reaction, not much changes. We sort of mentioned that, we mentioned why that sort of makes sense to use the condensed graph of reaction as a representation. But here we're going to use it for reaction prediction because if we want to go from these reactant materials to the product, all we have to do is really predict three edits to that graph. All we have to do is predict we're going to form a new bond. So we're going from a zeroth order bond between these two atoms to a second order bond. Then we predict that we're going from a second, um, second order uh, to a zeroth order bond, and then we break that. And then we sort of go to that final product. And so it's really only this, you know, a couple of steps that takes us from the reactants to the product. And so in some ways, this is more efficient because we're not completely generating this product from scratch. We're really just looking at the reactants and saying, where are the electrons going? And there's some relationship to, you know, mechanism here. It's not a very strong one, um, but in theory, you know, we have some sort of conservation of mass going on. And so we're just changing the connectivity in order to predict the reaction product. Yep. So now think about reaction development tasks. This is where we're starting to move into conditions and thinking about how we actually perform the reaction. Because if you're a synthetic chemist and you're trying to make a molecule, it doesn't make sense to just predict a retrosynthetic route. You have to know exactly how you're going to carry out that transformation. Or if you're trying to use a robotic platform, you have to tell your robot, here are the exact sort of conditions under which the reaction should proceed, here are the quantities, et cetera. 
And so people like to call this sort of the above the arrow problem, where we're trying to identify at least the reagents, catalysts, and solvents. And if we go to Reaxis and we look at, okay, what do people actually use for these reactions? We get these kinds of um, uh, inverse power law plots. Here we're looking at the number of reaction instances that use a particular catalyst or solvent as a function of the rank of that catalyst or solvent. Basically, what you find is that people love palladium. Um, so the top you know, 100 have a lot of palladium species in the catalysts. And the solvents, you know, we have sort of a few very common solvents listed at the top. But the conclusion is that we can truncate these, we can truncate these uh, sort of histograms without losing that much. We don't need more than a couple hundred solvents to do most chemistry. And so what that means is we can actually take this prediction task of what catalyst to use, what solvent to use, and treat it as a classification. Because we can list out the number of options, right, that makes sense. And so we can list out this finite number of options and make this prediction. And that's really the approach that we've been taking in this space. Um, we sort of take a reaction fingerprints, sort of capturing what change in connectivity between B, C to A. And then we, as a classification, we predict the catalyst, solvents, reagents, and then as a regression, we predict the temperature. So we have sort of a, a classifier chain that makes these sequential predictions. And others in the field have also done similar approaches where you, for different reactions, you need to predict maybe the metal, you need to predict the ligands, the base, as a classification task. Conditions really are at the stage where it's all about um, categorical variables, not continuous variables, and it's not de novo generation. So after this stage, sort of in developing a route, we will have some notion of the conditions to use, but it's not going to be a very precise recommendation. Right? Because these don't include the concentrations or equivalence ratios or anything like that. And so that sort of leads us to the next task, which is condition optimization. Again, a source of feedback whenever you're making imperfect predictions is going to be experimental data. And to close the reaction optimization is a really big topic, at least in, in chemical engineering, where we essentially use a surrogate model to tell us, based on different conditions, what do we think the yield will be? It turns out that this is a very old task. I feel like this happens to me all the time, right? If you're working on a chemical problem, someone probably already started working on it a very long time ago to read the literature. But here we can see this paper from the late 70s, where what they did was they had this closed-up optimization, where they had these automated reactions in a CSTR, they had an automated LC column using a Waters, you know, HPLC, like we would do today. Then they had a computer, could only imagine what programming this was like, which then decided what conditions to use in the next round of experiments. And they had this closed-up optimizer working, right, in the late 70s. And we've really been doing the same thing ever since, getting a little bit fancier with the types of models we use, you know, using things like Gaussian processes or other types of regression architectures. We call it Bayesian optimization now, um, but the idea is the same. The idea is that we have a model that tells us how conditions map onto yield, and we use that to direct the selection of experiments. So reactions, or sorry, models to predict uh, reaction yields are also useful in isolation, and so this is just going to be an example from a high-throughput screening data set. So here, this is work from Abby Doyle, where they're trying to take this uh, set of CN couplings from Merck, and they're trying to build a model that understands how all of these different aspects of the conditions influences the yield of the reaction. So in this case, they've got a sort of fixed number of components. And so what they did was they use expert descriptors to describe all these species. They had some computation to, to parameterize them. They trained a few different models, including a random forest that works pretty well. And they had this nice parity plot that shows, yes, you can predict the yield um, for this data set. And I just want to sort of make it clear that if you're using descriptors for these reaction informatics tasks, you don't have to be super creative about the machine learning formulation. Right, so if you represent your additive with a fixed length feature vector, likewise your arrow halide, your base, your ligands, this is just a numerical regression. Right? And this is a type of regression that many of you might have performed in classes or you can sort of get um, sort of tutorials on doing this. But it's, it's sort of this matrix formatted data to predict the yield. It's a very clean formulation once you have the data. Now, also in this sort of reaction development category, is thinking about how do we actually find new catalysts or ligands. If we're trying to use models to help us discover new catalysts and ligands, really what we're talking about is building surrogates that go from the structure of these species to some performance measure. 
whether that's yield or whether that's selectivity. And this formulation, right, this input-output pairing looks exactly like any QSR model or QSPR model, right? It's just taking a structure and trying to predict some scalar property. And so, you know, there's a lot of work that's been done in this field, often using descriptors, uh, like this work from Matt Sigmund, where they built a model to learn a very low parameter linear free energy relationship uh, to explain an anti selectivity or the structure-based example from Scott Denmark at Illinois, where they use these sort of voxelized representations of chiral phosphoric acids as their input. But again, these are truly just QSAR models, right? And sort of all the machinery that you know about from small molecules applies in this setting, this sort of subfield of reaction informatics. So we're going to move into a sort of really much more open-ended topics of reaction discovery. This is where the field is moving towards, but it's not an area where we actually have that much compelling work at this stage. And so this first test to talk about is mechanism elucidation. Right? Can we take published experimental data and learn about reaction mechanisms? Chemists often communicate mechanisms in terms of arrow pushing diagrams. And so it's very natural to think, well, can we train a model to push arrows? And so that's work that John Bradshaw did with um, Miguel Hernandez Albato at Cambridge, training this model to predict the product of chemical reactions by predicting a series of electron movements. So these are really pseudo mechanisms. And so you get these explanations that make sense for sort of polar reactions or sort of nucleophiles and electrophiles mixing together. But if you look at catalytic reactions like this again, Suzuki coupling, these models are going to predict pseudo mechanisms that ignore the presence of a catalyst. Because if you're a machine learning model and you're trying to predict the product given these reactants, you know the product is going to be a Suzuki product regardless of whether there's palladium present. And so nothing teaches these models about the role of a catalyst and so we aren't actually getting true mechanisms out of this uh, task. If we have sort of yield prediction models or selectivity prediction models mm -hmm. and we're lucky, we can use simple sort of descriptor ablation or sort of descriptor analysis to figure out what descriptors are the most strongest uh, determinants of performance. This is work from Abby Doyle and Matt Sigmund that showed there's a single descriptor of their ligand that actually explained this reactivity cliff. Right, so we talk about sort of structure activity cliffs, you see the same thing in catalysts in synthetic chemistry. Depending on the structure of the ligand, you can get these very sharp reactivity cliffs. And in this case, it was explained entirely by this percent varied volume, which is a minimum taken over all the conformers accessible to this um, phosphine ligands. Again, that's really if you're lucky. And this is really an expert playing with the model. It's not so much the model telling you something that you didn't help find out. Um, so this is still something that I guess is in progress, I would say. The last sort of discovery task to mention is new method development. This is really trying to discover brand new reactions. I think this is kind of the holy grail of reaction informatics, where we're trying to discover new synthetic methods, right? new chemistries that might get their own name or that might impress at least a chemist, right? which is a, it's a very high bar in this field. So here, if we're trying to talk about discovering a new type of reaction, we have to really define what new means. And that's a very contentious topic, it turns out. And so just a couple of the approaches that have been taken to give you a sense of, of where, what the field's thinking about. We again have this work by Marvin Seigler. We were thinking about discovering new reactions as new combinations of known half reactions. So we see functional groups that we're familiar with. We see species that we know how they react in different contexts. And we draw analogies between them. We have these multiple presents that we can connect we can basically say, well, I have seen one react before. I've seen uh, species four react before. Based on what I've seen them do, I think that there's a way that these two will react in this new mode. And so this is, again, just sort of drawing analogies between molecular structures using notions of similarity, substructure matching, uh, to get these ideas for new transformations. Uh, the other one that I'll mention is um, sort of work that uses a generative model instead. There's a poster about this as well. We use a train agenda model to propose new reaction smiles represented in, in different ways. You essentially have this generative model then churning out these new ideas for reactions and you can impose this filtering pipeline that sort of narrows things down and says, okay, well, is this really new, right? Is there a different reaction center? Is it just different substrates? And again, these are sort of how we impose our beliefs about what it means to have a new reaction. 
But in terms of you know, any use of machine learning or informatics to discover new types of reactions based on experimental data, these are really the most compelling examples that we have so far. And I think um, they're making good progress towards it, but there's still a long way to go in terms of inventing new methods the way synthetic chemists invent new methods. Our models do not think in the terms that a chemist thinks. Uh, so again, just sort of zooming back out, I know it's a very sort of quick whirlwind overview of some of these tasks in reaction informatics, but I, I wanted to just convey the sort of breadth of topics that we can work on in the way that these relate to what people think of as more traditional chem informatics topics. So we sort of moved from the simple cases of development and retrosynthetic planning, all the way up to the very open-ended discovery examples where there's not as much work as we would like. And what I will do in the last minute is just do the shameless plug for the open reaction database, um, which again, it is really this effort to try to have a new way of standardizing and sharing reaction data for the chemistry community. And so you know, we have sort of our, our nice quote, we're trying to support these downstream applications in machine learning. Um, but really what we're doing is we're defining a structure for data. We're defining the repository for sharing it. And we're trying to change the attitude around data sharing. And so we've got a fantastic um, advisory board, some names that you may or may not recognize. And we're sort of trying to get some you know, company commitments. So when you are a pharmaceutical company and you're running these high throughput screens of thousands of reactions, if you don't care about the intellectual property, you should be able to release those. And you should be able to publish those reactions, not as an Excel spreadsheet or a PDF, but as a structured format that really captures all the information about reactivity that we wanted to use for building models. So a couple of quick closing thoughts. Um, you know, these tools, again, as expressed by the preference diagrams, have matured. Chemists and industry do use them. They use synthesis planning tools. All the pharma companies I know are evaluating multiple synthesis planning tools internally. Um, Data-driven methods in particular are quite nice because you can just retrain them on your internal electronic lab notebook data, which is quite convenient. Um, but there's a limit to what these tools are doing. And so I've tried to convey, I think, the reality of the situation throughout the talk. Um, but really, we have this sort of challenge that the recommendations we're making aren't actionable because we're missing things like concentrations from our database. Uh, we're not inventing new methods. We're not helping with the most complex syntheses, and we're not replacing experts, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of caveats here. Um, but what we are developing are useful assistance to help synthetic chemists in the lab and to help plan how to synthesize new compounds that we generate uh, de novo or through enumeration. And so that I'll just sort of acknowledge um, funding in particular from uh, the MLPDS consortium, as well as um, uh, very fun to work with uh, the current research group. So thank you very much for the invitation to be here and for your attention. mechanistic modeling so develop a model that would predict the most labile bond in the molecule heterolytic style homolytic style the, the, the most aggressive electrophile the most aggressive nucleophile and to build on that because uh, uh, i have no knowledge maybe you have seen things like that but it would make sense to me it's... yeah yeah absolutely so uh, Pierre Baldi at University of California, Irvine, um, has built mechanistic predictors that operate by those same principles. It tries to sort of learn where electrons move, it tries to match nucleophiles and electrophiles. And you can do that for many types of reactions that are again driven by those sort of just polar um, interactions. The, the challenge is that for those types of chemistries, there's no data on mechanisms. And so actually the, the way that Pierre trains things is they write down expert rules about reaction mechanisms. Um, you could imagine trying to use some sort of DFT or like XTB, some quick method as computational feedback as far as what steps are possible. Um, but where things fall apart, I think, especially is in a lot of transformations that are synthetically relevant to medicinal chemists. Uh, you have relatively complex catalytic mechanisms and sometimes mechanisms that aren't even well understood. And so you can't necessarily rely on 
ground truth mechanisms um, for the predictions. But I think for a large class, especially for like gas phase chemistry, that works beautifully, what you just described. Um, so uh, thank you for the presentation. And I think my question will be about inter interpretable AI. Mm -hmm. So for example, right now we have uh, one step retrosynthesis and we can predict right now new products or new reactants. But now uh, we have a new question. Can we ask model which actually reaction it used to create this kind of products? And in general, my question is, are we moving from the, the black box models to more interpretable models in, art, uh, in deep learning? Yes, so I'd say that interpretability is, has not taken a strong, um, well, interpretability meaning different things in different contexts um, is not that prevalent in a lot of reaction informatics tasks. I think in terms of the sort of reaction prediction, sorry if I just got lost. Right, so in terms of reaction prediction, people are thinking about these you know, pseudo mechanistic things to try to understand again, maybe what's the most labile bond, bond, what breaks first, what's the most electrophilic or nucleophilic. And that gives us some insight into what's being learned. Um, there's also the descriptor based methods, which people like to say are in inherently interpretable. Um, but it's been, I think, very difficult for the field to find any sort of middle grounds. I think chemists are so used to using reaction mechanisms as the basis for their explanations that it's hard to imagine an interpretable model, interpretable model that does anything other than generate a mechanism. Uh, so I think that's still something that the field is exploring, but there's not a lot of convincing work, I would say that. Maybe a last short question with a short answer, possibly. <coughs> Hi, Connor. Thanks for your talk. Uh, very enjoying the uh, reaction informatics uh, overview. So just want to ask, uh, you mentioned about uh, reactions or other databases that are missing some uh, information, such as the side product, the conditions, and uh, um, like the, uh, we noticed it's also missing the stoichiometry. So just want to ask, um, because we are doing chemical engineering and very care about uh, scaling up, so like the math flows, uh, like the side pro product and the stoichiometry is something that uh, is very important for a complete reaction. So uh, what do you think there's a way you can predict the side products and also like complete these reactions or maybe including these things in your open reaction database? Yeah, great, great question. So, so everything, can be accommodated in the open reaction database if that information is available. As far as predicting the missing pieces, I think at least um, I'll say byproducts to balance reactions might be possible. Although I think there is often legitimate ambiguity in what the byproducts are from some of these reactions. So if you have a simple coupling, maybe it's a, a halide salt and that's easy to predict, but sometimes you might not know the actual fates. Um, so for example, you know, what happens to MCPBA after it oxidizes, right? We might not have any way of knowing the fate of that species, even though the oxygen, right, moves into the epoxide. Um, and so I think some things can't be predicted, but I think overall we can try to balance reactions. We can you know, learn how to do atom mapping. We can learn other useful auxiliary tasks related to what you described. So I think at the end of the day, chemists just have to provide the information um, into these data sets. Okay, thank you very much, Grant.